SpaceX has just done something incredible. We are looking at the greatest accomplishment of science and engineering since men first set foot on the moon. But what we've seen so far is only just scratching the surface of what Starship is really capable of, or should be capable of if this rocket is going to deliver on Elon Musk's grand vision, an interplanetary transport system that will build a city on Mars. And while Elon always likes to make it sound like going to Mars is just the next big thing, he's often a little short with details on how exactly that's going to get done. So we know where we stand today and we know where we're trying to go in the future. Now what has to happen in between to make that possible? You see, every time that SpaceX has launched Starship, they have achieved a historic milestone. Even that time that Starship blasted a giant crater into the Earth, then spun around for two minutes and blew up, that was still the most powerful rocket to ever lift off. And in order to continue developing Starship towards Elon's ultimate goal, SpaceX is going to need to keep that trend alive with many, many more unprecedented, improbable, history-making successes to come. We can simplify this a little bit by breaking the process down into three milestones, orbit, moon, and Mars. While SpaceX has technically been conducting orbital test flights of Starship over the past year, the ship itself has yet to truly orbit the Earth, which can sound a little confusing. So here's the deal. The Starship is gigantic. It's the single largest object ever put into space by a pretty wide margin, and that makes it almost equally as dangerous if it were to go one step further and achieve orbital velocity. When you orbit the Earth, you're essentially in a constant state of freefall, but you're moving forward at such a high speed that you actually fall around the curvature of the planet. Still confusing, I know. Think about throwing a baseball. The harder you throw the ball, the further it will travel before it gets pulled down into the gravity of the Earth. Now imagine that you could throw a baseball so hard that it could travel for 100 miles before gravity pulled it down. Now something interesting starts to happen. The Earth itself will actually curve down and away from the ball, allowing it to travel even further before eventually hitting the ground. The ball is still falling down, but the ground keeps moving further away. Now imagine you could throw that ball hard enough to travel such a long distance, the Earth just keeps on curving away and giving the ball more and more room to fall until it eventually comes all the way around and hits you in the back of the head. That is orbit. So what SpaceX has been doing with Starship is getting it up to a speed where it can travel most of the way around the Earth, but it's still moving slow enough that the ground will eventually catch up to it. Here's the reason why they do this. It means that even if every system on the Starship fails, it will inevitably fall back down to Earth, and that fall will happen in a very predictable location, which in this case is the middle of the Indian Ocean, a giant, empty void where no one is going to be around to get hurt. Now, if Starship were to travel just a little bit faster, it would reach orbital velocity, which is that state of constant freefall around the curvature of the Earth. Now, in the vacuum of space, there's not really anything that's going to slow you down, so once you achieve orbit, you're up there for the long haul. That's how satellites work. So imagine the Starship vehicle achieves orbital velocity, and then it experiences a total system failure. Now we've got this massive steel structure spinning around the Earth and totally out of control. That is not good. And over a period of time, even the very thin amount of atmosphere up there will begin to slow that starship back down, and it will inevitably fall into the gravity of the Earth. This happens all the time. Spent rocket stages, old satellites, bits of space junk, they fall down and re-enter the atmosphere. And with these smaller objects, they mostly just burn up and disintegrate as they move through this process. Occasionally, you'll get a little bit of material that reaches the surface. There's been a few North American farmers who have discovered pieces of SpaceX metal in their cow fields, but the impact is minimal. Now imagine the same thing happening with a starship. There is going to be more than just a few chunks of metal hitting the surface. All that to say, achieving a full orbit is going to be another major milestone for Starship that is coming very soon. 
It's not as exciting as catching a rocket with a giant robot tower, but it will involve getting the ship up to a higher velocity than ever before and performing a controlled deorbit burn to slow it back down for a safe return to Earth. That is the real orbital test flight. And once SpaceX is able to do that, then the next milestone becomes successfully deploying a payload into orbit. And this is one where Elon definitely makes it sound way too easy. Payload presents a whole new problem for SpaceX to solve. Your typical rocket will use a disposable cargo fairing to carry its payload into orbit. The nose cone of the rocket is just two halves of clamshell design that simply fall away when the upper stage clears the atmosphere. So to deploy the final payload, the remaining segment of the rocket just kind of lets go and the two float away from each other. Starship does not work like that. The only other vehicle that's even comparable to Starship in this regard would be the old space shuttle. It had cargo bay doors on the backside of the orbiter that would open and close to deploy a payload. This is very complex, a bit too complex for Starship right now. Eventually, this is something that SpaceX will need to figure out, but in the meantime, they have an easier solution, the Pez dispenser. So instead of opening a giant cargo bay door, Starship is going to open just one small slot on the backside of the vehicle. The reason that SpaceX is able to get away with this is because they know exactly the payload that the first Starships will be deploying into orbit, Starlink. Each Starlink satellite is designed to be long, wide, and thin. So the payload slot on Starship only needs to be big enough to dispense these Starlinks one at a time, like a Pez candy. The internal mechanism is pretty simple. Just like the candy dispenser, it launches each Starlink out while simultaneously pushing the next satellite into position. If Starship can manage to reach orbit with a payload full of satellites, then we can move forward to the next big milestone, which is orbital propellant transfer. Again, Musk would tell you this is actually the easiest part. On the one hand, this is a pretty simple concept, but on the other, it's something that's never been done before, and that should tell you something. Two starships need to be deployed into orbit, one of them carrying a payload of rocket fuel, specifically liquefied oxygen and some liquefied methane as well. The two will then meet up and dock with each other in a back-to-back -back configuration. The ship with the propellant on board will then transfer that payload through the docking point into the fuel tanks of the second ship. The refilling session will give the starship more energy that it can burn to reach an even faster orbital velocity and in turn rise higher above the Earth. Now, docking two spacecraft together in orbit has been done on a relatively frequent basis since the mid-1960s. Back in the old days, this was done manually by pilots lining everything up with their eye. In the modern day, we've transitioned this job over to automated systems, but even that is a pretty recent development. Just five years ago, the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft would pull up to the ISS in a position that was very close, but not close enough to dock. Then it would be grabbed by the Canada arm and robotically berthed to the station's docking port. Currently, when the SpaceX Dragon travels to the ISS, the two spacecraft systems will talk to each other and figure out a way to line everything up. Even though the hardware and software on Dragon is totally different from what's used on the space station, they can still perform this very high precision maneuver. Now, in Elon's mind, if a SpaceX vehicle can successfully dock with a NASA vehicle, then it should be relatively easy for a SpaceX vehicle to dock with another SpaceX vehicle. But this has yet to be proven, and it's also worth considering that fitting two human-sized docking ports together might be easier than aligning two fuel pipes that barely stick up from the back of the rocket. You're basically crashing two starships into each other just at a very slow speed, hopefully. Now, if the orbital docking and refilling can be mastered, then we're finally ready to move into the next major phase of Starship development, the Moon. With freshly refilled propellant tanks, the Starship can refire its main engines and rise higher above the Earth, getting so high that it will eventually reach the Moon. But Starship isn't going there for fun. SpaceX has made a historical commitment to NASA that Starship will be the first vehicle in over five decades to deliver people to the surface of the Moon. So here's what that looks like. A lunar variant of the Starship is going to be built that removes the wings, the heat shield, and adds a set of landing legs. Then it travels to orbit, docks with a propellant depot in orbit, and refills for its trip to the moon. Now, Getting to the moon is the easy part. Landing on the moon 
will be considerably more difficult. We have seen the way that Starship lands on the Earth. It comes down into the atmosphere at around a 45 degree angle, kicks up a ton of fire and slows down to a relatively low velocity thanks to resistance from the air. Then the Starship angles over even more to a 90 degree belly flop maneuver that maximizes drag for the last few kilometers of the fall. And then there's a dramatic landing burn where the ship's three smaller engines relight and flip the whole thing into a vertical orientation where it slowly descends down into a landing. That won't work on the moon. It has no atmosphere, there's no drag. Hence, the lunar starship has no use for wings or a heat shield. So what SpaceX needs to do is relearn how to land their giant vehicle in a totally new environment. What's the worst that could happen? Many have tried and failed to land on the moon, even in recent years, with the most advanced computer and AI technology, this is no easy task. And that's why the first time that Starship attempts its moon landing, there won't be any people on board. Now, this is a huge milestone, and it's one that SpaceX needs to reach as fast as possible. The crewed Artemis moon landing is currently on the schedule for 2026. We all know that is not going to happen, but that doesn't take any of the pressure off because China is gearing up for their own crewed lunar landing, and the last thing that the Americans want to do is lose a new space race to the Chinese. So, assuming the test landing goes well, then Starship immediately goes into preparation for the main event, Artemis 3, NASA's return to the surface of the moon. Everything that Starship has achieved up until this point has been historic, but that all pales in comparison to the global and cultural significance of the crude lunar landing. Now, let's say that theoretically, all of this landing on the moon stuff goes smoothly, that only opens up an even bigger and more challenging third phase for Starship. Mars. This is what the Starship was built for. None of what we just said would be happening if not for Elon Musk's original goal of sending large quantities of people and supplies to the Red Planet and establishing a permanent, self-sufficient outpost there. But needless to say, this is, yet again, going to be an incredibly difficult, unprecedented milestone to achieve no matter what Elon tells us. Now, if we go by what SpaceX and Elon have been telling us lately, it's entirely possible that the Lunar Starship and the Mars Starship can be developed in parallel, with each ready to go for their first landing attempt in just two short years from now. This is ambitious as usual, but not impossible. The advantage being that the Starship we already know today, the one designed for operation in low Earth orbit, is incredibly similar to the Starship that would be designed to land on Mars. The only significant difference really would be the addition of landing legs to the Mars ship, because there won't be a Mechazilla Tower on the Red Planet waiting to catch the rocket. So when you look at it that way, making an attempt at landing on Mars is not that difficult. After the orbital refilling is complete, the Starship with legs would set course for Mars and see what happens. Most likely, what happens will be an epic crash landing on the Red Planet, and that's fine. That's how SpaceX develops their technology. They try, they fail, they learn, and they try again. The most impressive thing that the company has demonstrated so far is the ability to learn and adapt quickly. It took four explosions of the SN series prototypes before Starship nailed a suborbital landing burn. It took just one explosion of a full-stack Starship Super Heavy before the rocket made it to stage separation on its second flight. It took one explosion of the upper stage in space to achieve re-entry. It took one failed re-entry to achieve the first landing burn from space. It took two booster explosions to get the first super heavy water landing. And on the first tower catch attempt of the super heavy booster, there was no failure at all. So that's just something very important to keep in mind. SpaceX could very well fail to achieve any of the milestones we've just laid out on the first attempt. And that wouldn't be the end of the world. It would simply be a part of the process. And only then, after the right combination of success and failure is achieved, that's when we go to Mars. But there is a lot of work to be done in between, probably more than Elon Musk would willingly admit. <laughs>